So now we have this system where we have a kind of global transactional logging thing, right? Everything you know, is in this big computer network and everything's linked to everything else. Um, the project that I was part of is called Ethereum. And Ethereum came along a few years after Bitcoin and said, well, that's really fun, but what if it was programmable? Right? And Bitcoin was like a bank account. You had coins. You could receive payments. You could send payments. Well, that's OK, but why can't I write a little computer program that figures out when something should be paid? You know, suppose I want a direct debit and I want to pay, make a payment once a month. Well, why can't I have a program that does that? Well, you know, why don't you just run it on your laptop? Well, what if my laptop is closed? What I want to do is I want to take the logic for that repeated payment and I want to put it in my bank account, kind of like you do with a standing order. So the idea of writing little computer programs that do things like standing orders and putting them in the bank account, kind of lodged with the bank, only there's no bank, but kind of lodged with the bank, gave rise to this idea of Ethereum. We're going to make a programmable blockchain. So you have this network, the, the big computer network is called a blockchain. You have the big computer network, but now you can write little programs that run on it. And for historical reasons, these little programs are called smart contracts. And smart contracts are not particularly sophisticated yet. They're nothing like legal contracts. They're really much more like standing orders. Uh, programmable payments or programmable money are good ways of talking about them. So the kinds of things that you can do with smart contracts that you can't normally do are uh, relatively simple things. So um, for people who are buying and selling across currencies, you can do things like have an order that when a particular currency becomes cheap, you'll automatically buy some of it. But that system isn't run by a broker or a dealer. It's kind of inherent to the fabric which is carrying the payments really programmable money. Um, you could take an example for something like, um, uh, take a gambling game. Right? If two people want to play poker on the internet, they're either trusting somebody to sit in the middle of their poker game and take the payments from both sides and deal the cards. But if you're very, very, very clever, you can write a smart contract that basically generates the cards and takes the payments and transfers the money to the winner when the game is over. And that sort of stuff sort of has limited utility. There aren't that many people that enjoy poker. But you know, the sort of seed of the idea is there, that if you could do it for poker, maybe you could do it for auctions. And if you could do auctions that have this kind of automated logic and instant payment and all the rest of the attributes you get from these things, you begin to think, like, maybe that's a part of the real world. And you know, if you had a system where you had the ability to do an auction, but it didn't go through something like eBay, you know, eBay charges quite a lot of money for hosting auctions. It's something like 10% of all the money that goes through eBay stays with eBay. And that's why eBay is an enormous company. Well, the buyers and the sellers are paying for eBay to exist in the same way that the buyers and the sellers are paying for Uber to exist, in the same way that the buyers and the sellers are paying for Airbnb to exist. So quite a lot of people who are involved in this whole space, blockchains and cryptocurrencies and all of these things, are looking at those enormous companies as potential um, inefficiencies in capitalism that could be pulled out and replaced. You know, if you have something that works like eBay but it's 10% cheaper, you will tend to shop there. If you have something that looks like Airbnb and it's 10% cheaper, you'll tend to shop there. And these things, because they're living in this global computer network rather than inside of a specific cluster of servers somewhere, these things have a certain magical property, which is that they're global by default. They're everywhere from the day that you launch them, and the services are universally available. And this is quite interesting, because you think about the edge of the network. You know, we're not really very good at going beyond, say, the two billion richest people on Earth when we begin to talk about the internet and the services that it provides. But if you're in a position where you know, some bunch of kids build a hotel rental website for California, but it's actually on the blockchain and it's global by default. It's just born global. And then you discover that, you know, folks in South Africa are using it to you know, rent housing to each other. And then the next thing you know, it's Mali. And then you realize that it's being used in villages all over the world for some completely unintended purpose. That kind of output and outcome is much more likely with the blockchain than it is with the conventional sort of uh, website model. 
The fact that these networks are inherently global, the fact that all the logic is kind of buried in the payments architecture, uh, the fact that there's no real recognition of international borders in these systems because they all operate embedded in the internet. They, they don't see the world as a set of countries. They just see it as an enormous global network. All of those things point to the possibility, currently very far off, but they point to the possibility that you'll begin to see global service architectures that run on these systems. Not just the payments, which we already have, and they're being used very successfully in a lot of poor countries, but also the possibility that the services which are built on top of those payments will turn out also to be global by default, and that that will turn into a very substantial development bonus. Um, very early days. Right? We're at the point where we've just about got the thing off the runway. We've given it a few kind of scoots around. But in terms of the size of these systems, you know, 200 billion sounds like a lot of money. But the total value of all the things in the world that have prices is said to be $700 trillion. So we're in a position where we're only at the very, very, very beginning of this kind of digitization of money. Um, this is only the start.